Dear Kasia, thank you so much uh, for your kind introduction. It's wonderful to be back on day two of the Warsaw Security Forum, which may have uh, left the best for last because this is a very timely, very important uh, topic and session that we will now address uh, US foreign policy beyond 2020 change or continuity. That is the question we will address within the next 50 minutes with, of course, your active participation. There will once again be a poll, but also the questions that you will address to the three panelists will be, uh, will be forwarded by me uh, to them as we go along. It is my great pleasure to welcome the Managing Director of the Penn Biden Center for Diplomacy and Global Engagement, Michael Carpenter. Also delighted to welcome retired General David Petraeus, the former CIA director and the current chairman of the KKR Global Institute. Also joining us or will be joining us is the member of the US House of Representatives uh, from Ohio and co-chair of the Poland, Ukraine and Hungary caucuses, Marcy Kaptur. Welcome to the three of you and uh, General, let's dive right into the discussion and focus and look at one particular piece of news that is hot of the press, something that is of great concern and interest to you, I gather. Uh, the, the America has announced that it will reduce the number of troops in Iraq and Afghanistan to 2,500 in each country by January. Now, obviously, you have commanded coalition forces, both in Iraq and US and NATO forces in Afghanistan. You know both country very well. Let me get your take on that decision to reduce the troops in both countries. Well, thanks very much, Ali, and great to be with you again, and also great to be back with the Warsaw Security Forum, even if it's on a virtual stage rather than the actual stage uh, in Warsaw itself. Uh, I am very concerned about the announcement of the plan to withdraw forces and to go down to 2,500 in Afghanistan in particular. Uh, Iraq, I think, actually is much less concerning. Uh, there's an awful lot of enablers very close by in the neighborhood there on the Gulf, in Kuwait, in Jordan, various other places, and up and down the Gulf, if need be. And there will still be a decent footprint and a country with very considerable resources, $100 billion in oil revenue in a given year, uh, and reasonably capable security forces that we will still be able to continue to enable uh, in intelligence services. Afghanistan is very much a different matter. Uh, the security situation has been eroding there over the last couple of years. Uh, we have nonetheless continued to reduce our forces there. We seem to have a way of supporting the Afghan security forces, providing training and equipping, advising, assisting, and enabling. And it's the enabling that is most important, uh, that enabling most of it by drones and other precision air assets that we can bring to bear to support the Afghan security forces when they get in a tough situation. Uh, but my fear is that withdrawing below the 4,500 that reportedly is the level that the current commander, Scott Miller, who I know we're together on battlefields for the better part of the final decade that I served in uniform in Iraq and in Afghanistan when I commanded both of those. Uh, again, that would be a big concern. Ideally, reduction should always be conditions based. Uh, I don't see the conditions for taking another uh, reduction in Afghanistan right at this point in time. Uh, we have already allowed the Taliban to have 5,000 or so of their detainees released to them to get that U.S. Taliban agreement. This would give them an, one of their next objectives, which is to get us to leave without even getting anything back from them in return. And certainly their pledge to reduce violence is not uh, evidently being uh, carried out. Uh, and, and beyond that, there's a concern that at some point in time, you just see a crumbling of the security forces of Afghanistan that have fought so valiantly. I mean, they are fighting and dying in very substantial numbers on the front lines of their country, which is what, again, we worked very hard during the surge that I was pr uh, privileged to command. In fact, during the previous administration, the Obama-Biden administration, uh, and after which we had successive reductions that were carried out without the kind of erosion of security that you are now seeing because those security forces have been built up, institutions were built up, and we were able to uh, continue to support and enable them. I know that obviously no one wants to end endless wars more than those who have fought them or commanded them, uh, so that I very much share that. 
But the fact is that you have to end an endless war responsibly. Uh, you, 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 we say that we are, quote, ending an endless war. You're actually not. Uh, you are generally ending your involvement in the endless war, and the war may go on. And you may have to return, as we did have to, uh, in the wake of the withdrawal of all our combat forces from Iraq, when the prime minister of Iraq pursued highly sectarian policies that undid all that we'd worked so hard to do during the surge uh, it alienated the Sunni Arabs and allowed the Islamic State, formerly Al-Qaeda in Iraq, to reconstitute itself, and we know what happened then. In this case, it is very notable that the majority leader of the Senate actually spent nine minutes on the floor of the Senate, Senate expressing his own concerns uh, about this, <clears throat> and even invoking the specter of Saigon in 1975. You remember the image of of the final people climbing off the roof, be taken off the roof of the embassy uh, by helicopters. I mean, that is quite a significant statement. And it does capture, I think, the concerns that many of us have who have been involved in this uh, over a number of decades now, and who recognize that we went there for a reason. It was to eliminate the sanctuary that Al Qaeda had when the Taliban ruled that country and the 9-11 attacks were were planned in that sanctuary and the initial training conducted there. We have stayed to prevent them from reestablishing that sanctuary. And now you have the Islamic State tragically there trying to do the same thing. We've beaten this back repeatedly over the years. Um, and also we should acknowledge that this has been a very important country when it comes to providing a platform for the kinds of regional counterterrorism uh, operations that have been undertaken from time to time, such as in the final month or so that I was in Kabul uh, when the operation to bring Osama bin Laden to justice uh, was indeed undertaken. So again, I think a lot of areas of concern, I would hope actually still that perhaps the number 2,500 could be referred to as aspirational and there could be some conditions established uh, that would prevent going below 4,500 unless they are met. In which case, then, again, if conditions are met, that, is, that would be warranted. But I do not at this time see the kinds of conditions that a prudent military commander would recommend should be met uh, being in existence at this point. Clearly, uh, I can think hardly of any other person who would be more qualified to comment on this announcement of troop withdrawal. General, thank you so much uh, for your extensive remarks. Uh, Mike. Uh, this troop reduction in both uh, Iraq and Afghanistan would be implemented basically days before President-elect Joe Biden would take office. Clearly a decision that would heavily impact the incoming administration. Indeed. Uh, and I think uh, General Petraeus has given a very good overview of the risks inherent in, in, in drawing down in, in both uh, countries. Look, what I think uh, you need to bear in mind is a couple of things. First of all, President-elect Biden has said that uh, when he gets into office, he's going to preside over a global force posture review that looks at all the various decisions that have been taken, but also at the status quo around the world, to include uh, President Trump's uh, announcement of the withdrawal of roughly 10,000 forces from Germany, uh, which is obviously next door to Poland and of concern, I think, to the listeners uh, that we have here with us today. Uh, that will be reviewed. They're going to look uh, in detail at what is most uh, effective in terms of deterrence and defense posture, both in the East Asian theater and the Middle East in Europe. Um, and then, uh, you know, I think decisions will flow from that. So that's point number one. Point number two, in addition to the various uh, pitfalls that have been outlined by General Petraeus, I would just note that this decision was, was announced without consultation with our allies. And our allies are with us in both Iraq and Afghanistan. And um, how cavalier is it to make an announcement like this without uh, fully consulting uh, with our partners on the ground who have fought bravely with us over these uh, years, uh, if not decades in both countries. So look, I think the decision is gonna be reviewed. Uh, I think it's been reviewed in a holistic way where the next administration, as I said, looks at global force posture, not in isolation in various different theaters, but together. Um, and, and then, you know, decisions will flow from that. Uh, and uh, at this particular point, I'd like to now officially uh, uh, welcome <laughs> Congresswoman uh, Kapper, who's joining us. Welcome, uh, Congresswoman. Just uh, for your information, General, 
Petraeus and Mike Carpenter, we were evaluating the uh, Trump administration's decision to cut troops uh, next year in January in both Iraq and Afghanistan. If you may, you can jump in and, and, uh, and offer your opinion on this particular decision as well, of course. Yes, well, of course, uh, <clears throat> uh, there was a major election here in our country and we're so pleased with the results because the American people uh, in an historic large vote for uh, President-elect Biden reaffirmed America's commitments around the world to our allies and to the restoration of what I would call regular order uh, in terms of our foreign policy. The um, uh, respectful treatment of leaders of uh, nations across the world, no berating in public, uh, no embarrassing moments uh, internationally. I cannot wait until um, President-elect Biden is, uh, assumes office in January. And uh, I thought this period between um, an American election and the seating of that new president is a very tender time uh, in our country constitutionally. And no president should make any major foreign policy decision that we, one could consider destabilizing during that period of time. Uh, we currently have a president who is uh, unwilling to work with the new administration. And these are very troubling moments in our own history. We will self-correct. This is a powerful country on many, many, many levels. Uh, but to see this kind of behavior at this moment in history is really quite disturbing, but uh, fairly uh, emblematic of what has been occurring over the last four years in our country. But even democratic republics can make mistakes, but then they can correct them. <laughs> and that's what we will be about. And the Congress, we, we don't, uh, at least on my side of the aisle, we don't take any credit for the current president of the United States, but we believe that we've been a counterforce as a co-equal branch uh, of government uh, with the executive branch in terms of maintaining our commitments globally. And so we appreciate this forum today, obviously with General Petraeus, with uh, Director Mike Carpenter, uh, such respected Americans who have made a difference for our country throughout the world. To all the viewers out there, we once again have a poll. This one is called or titled or poses the question, uh, important one, of course, for this particular session. It will come up. What will be the top priority for the Biden administration in terms of foreign policy, I would add, since this is what we're talking about. That is, of course, the poll. So please uh, participate and we'll hear the results in due time. Of course, it's a very major question, General, what the top priorities are. And we'll get to that in just a second. But let me point out the very unique position that the United States is right in, perhaps historic. You have a defeated U.S. president who uh, declines and refuses to concede. From a security point of view, clearly this time it's different than in previous administration where the outgoing administration seems unwilling to cooperate uh, with the incoming one. How much does, it, how much does such conduct compromise America's security. Well, it's interesting to reflect back on the bipartisan uh, post 9-11 commission that was conducted. And it sought to determine what were the factors that led to what was essentially a very significant intelligence failure to identify the would-be perpetrators of the 9-11 attacks before they actually flew their planes into the World Trade Center towers and Pennsylvania and, and the Pentagon. Uh, and among the factors that was identified uh, was the delay and the lack of focus on the transition uh, from the Clinton administration to the Bush 43 administration because of the preoccupation with the recounts and recounts of votes in Florida. You remember a very, very close uh, election there that was going to determine the outcome for one side or the other. Uh, and the result was a delay in, again, getting on with the all-important business of moving from one uh, administration to another, and of course, from one party to another, which adds to the complexity of it. Uh, and then it starts, the delays start to add up, they accumulate. Uh, again, the focus is on what do we do about Florida? What's the next step? What about this? Instead of our next uh, secretary of this or that and the vetting process. Again, some of these actions can't be rushed. Uh, there have to be processes before people can get the very top secret compartment and intelligence 
uh, clearances, all the rest of this. And this seems like details or minutia. It's critically important uh, to, again, getting people into positions and up to speed. Keep in mind that it's much more than just a couple of national security briefs or a couple of days of the presidential daily brief. Uh, this is about marinating once again. And, you know, the Biden administration will bring back a very experienced group of people. We know, or at least we think we know, who the secretaries of defense and state and the national security advisor, all these others will likely be. Um, they know what they're doing. They were all in government up until four years ago, many of them. It won't take an enormous amount of time to get up to speed, except that they have not had access to some of the most highly classified uh, intelligence from the most important sources and methods. And again, you just don't get it with one briefing. You've got to sort of live it again. As I said, you have to marinate. You have to live and breathe it before you have that kind of nuanced, detailed understanding of the threats, of the challenges, of the opportunities, and so forth. Uh, that will face them when they assume office. And again, in the case of the 9-11 attacks, many months after uh, Bush 43 assuming uh, office in, in, in the January of that particular year, again, one of the factors was the... soldier left uh, you know yeah i have my <laughs> one final to protect the perimeter here at, at our combat outpost in arlington virginia there you go there you go you always are backed up no matter where you go it's it's lovely to have him nonetheless but mike all joke aside of course the lack of cooperation when it comes to transition is a security risk is of concern says uh general petraeus um and and uh you are, of course, the managing director of the Penn Biden Center. Can I call him back? And yes. global okay. engagement. Uh, Congresswoman, if I could ask you perhaps to turn off the microphone uh, if uh, in, in the meantime, sometimes. Um, the, the, uh, Sorry. No, no worries. No worries. It's just uh, so that we have a smooth sound. So, you know, these online debates can be quite tricky. Uh, Mike, let, let me come back to you. Uh, it's very clear that there are no lack of global challenges worldwide. It's also undoubtful that due to the America First policy, the U.S. has been largely absent from the global scene. I mean, just look at the many conflicts, Syria, Libya, Yemen, Belarus, Ukraine, <laughs> Nagorno-Karabakh. We could go on and on. The U.S. is largely absent. Do you think that America under a, or, or Biden administration is ready and willing to assume global leadership again. Absolutely. Look, I do, I and one of the one reasons- of the priorities uh, for a Biden administration is going to be rebuilding our alliances, uh, strengthening our partnerships in order to deal with a lot of the global challenges that you laid out, including uh, most importantly, cooperation on uh, finding a vaccine for COVID and distributing it, uh, emerging from the COVID pandemic with our economies intact, spurring an economic recovery uh, where many nations around the world are in a deep uh, recession. Um, and then working on other uh, issues like great power competition with Russia and China, like some of the other issues you mentioned, the war in Yemen, the conflict in Libya, the sort of messy peace now in Nagorno-Karabakh, pro-democracy movement in Belarus. All of those are things where we need to be working with our allies and partners and not against them. And so I think that's going to be a focus for the Biden administration, as well as uh, putting more emphasis on uh, democratic institutions, standing for democratic norms, supporting pro-democracy movements. 
I think you'll see a big contrast there between the last four years of Donald Trump uh, and what comes next under a Biden administration. So all of that will require U.S. leadership. It will require re-engagement. And as I said, rebuilding those alliances and partnerships. But it's also going to take a little dose of humility, to be honest. You know, we've We've seen over these last four years that the U.S. is not immune to demagogic populism. Uh, but I think we see from the statements of our close allies and partners, there was a good op-ed uh, written a couple of days ago by uh, Yves Le Drian um, and Heiko Maas in the Washington Post talking about how to re-energize the transatlantic relationship. I think our, our, our partners like the U.K., like France, like Germany, like Poland, uh, want us to re-engage. They're waiting for us to, to get back on the saddle uh, and talk to them about how we can align our strategic visions and then how we can go about sort of the tactical operational work of, of making those goals uh, realized. And so uh, we're, I think the Biden team is going to be ready to, to assume that task um, uh, on day one. And you've got a very experienced group of people that will be coming back into office to make that happen. The Biden administration will be ready and willing from day one, says Mike Carpenter, Congresswoman. In your opinion, what then, amidst all, uh, all the amounts and quantity, high quantity of global challenges, what, in your opinion, are the most pressing foreign policy issues uh, President Biden will have to tackle? I think to restore collaboration, first with our closest allies, and as uh, Director Carpenter has talked about, uh, dealing with issues of the pandemic, uh, sharing good practices, uh, reaffirming our uh, uh, cooperative relationships with uh, countries around the world and their leadership. I think in the area of climate change, you're going to see an immediate uh, shift. I'm not sure if it's just me, but I, for one, at this particular point, cannot hear the Congresswoman. You've been going in and out and out. The connection seems to be freezing up. General Mike, are you, are you hearing the same thing? Not, not here. Yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's a problem then that we're all having. Um, so it's a good plea for the Congress to invest in good online infrastructure. May want to suggest that she leave and come back. Yeah. Try it. Uh, my apologies, Congresswoman, you're in and out. Uh, the picture freezes up. But the question, of course, General, is, is, is still on the table. It's also what the poll is for this particular session, namely what will be the top priorities for the Biden administration to tackle in the for, on the foreign policy front? Well, I think at the end of the day, the U.S.-China relationship is not only the most important in the world for the U.S. and China, but for all the rest of the world. And it's probably more important than all the others together. That's not to say that the U.S. will not, as always, have to be the, the guy in the circus that gets it played up on a stick and gets it spinning and then gets a bunch of others, because there are lots. And Mike, highlighted some of these challenges that are out there. Congresswoman uh, did as well. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think it will be mostly about the U.S.-China relationship, even as you have Russia, even as you have extremists and cyber threats and all climate and all the other issues. And that, I think, is a bipartisan consensus as well, that there does need to be a degree of firmness with China, that the old adage that economics will Trump geopolitical challenges. And in other words, we can work our way through it because of our trade and economic relationships uh, has not proven true. And that now it is actually uh, economic, it is geopolitics that is actually constraining uh, and confining some of these critically important economic relationships. Let's keep in mind that when folks use this Cold War analogy, uh, that in the real Cold War, uh, the U.S. and the West had very little economic exchange with the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact. Uh, certainly the U.S. And, and the Soviet Union in particular had no meaningful trade other than some excess wheat from time to time. On the other hand, the U.S. and China were each other's biggest trading partners prior to the imposition of the tariffs. So there are huge uh, areas of mutual 
concern uh, and there are strong mutual uh, objectives actually when it comes to again resolving the pandemic bringing the world out of the global economic slowdown climate dealing with the ever pressing uh, issues of climate change and on and on there's a number of those and it will be hugely important uh, to for the US uh, to go about trying to engage and also frankly to influence China when it comes to ensuring no miscalculation uh, that could spiral into something very, very bad, uh, that this administration that's coming into office will do this not just as a whole of government. It will not just be a coherent, comprehensive, all tools, whole of government. It will be whole of governments with an S on the end, uh, where all of our allies and partners uh, will be engaged in this together. Um, and where multilateral organizations, international organizations and institutions and so forth uh, will be a prominent feature of this once again as well. So I think that's what I think that's what we can expect. Again, there will be lots of other issues uh, in other places, but it was, of course, the Obama Biden administration that began the process of the rebalance to Asia, which is the right word, not pivot, because they didn't pivot away from the Middle East. You stay focused on it, but the focus of the main effort and the main resources and the uh, primary objectives is uh, Asia. And we're going to have to consider about how do we get back into multilateral trade agreements uh, as well, noting that the Regional Comprehensive Economic Program was just ag agreed uh, with China as an element of it. Some of the countries that were in the Trans-Pacific Partnership joined that regulation and policy determination in these areas is steadily shifting to Asia and China, and we need to be part of that. And uh, if we can find a way to get back to the Trans-Pacific Partnership as a part of the overarching, coherent, comprehensive whole of governments with an S on the end uh, approach, uh, that is something that I would strongly applaud. Certainly a lot of uh, grounds you have covered indeed, uh, relations with uh, China, um, transatlantic uh, relations. Uh, another one, of course, Mike, is uh, President-elect Biden as vice president uh, was part of the administration that delivered the uh, nuclear deal, Iran nuclear agreements, uh, which, of course, uh, Donald Trump then uh, withdrew from. Uh, is that something that's, that's back on the table now that vice, vice uh, president, then vice president, and now president-elect Biden will be entering the White House in January? Well, the president-elect has been pretty clear that um, he would uh, like to rejoin the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action if Iran returns to its obligations under the agreement, which is not an easy task. This is gonna take quite a bit of diplomacy. But the place where we're at today um, is one where the United States is essentially isolated on the world stage with regards to trying to check Iran's nuclear program. Uh, whereas prior to the adoption of the JCPOA, you had Iran that was isolated on the world stage. And then you had the United States working with its European partners, the UK, France, and Germany, as well as with Russia and China, to put pressure on Iran to agree to that, uh, to that agreement, um, which did have vi verifiable checks on the expansion uh, of Iran's nuclear program, and particularly preventing it from having military component. And so what you see today is, of course, that that program continues apace. Um, Iran continues to invest in centrifuges and in fissile material. Um, and uh, the U.S. remains outside of any framework where it's able to do anything other than apply unilateral pressure. So, um, you know, I think there will be an attempt to um, to reevaluate uh, what is possible uh, and to enter into some sort of a diplomatic solution that that uh, that builds on the JCPOA and the obligations that are contained there. I also think, you know, a, a Biden administration is likely to look. Uh, also at strategic arms control with regards to Russia. I think that's going to be uh, an important thing that is, um, uh, that is considered from, from day one, especially given that the new START treaty expires on February 5th, only a matter of days, literally, uh, from Inauguration Day. And so in addition to Iran, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of emphasis on, uh, on, on getting that strategic arms control framework in place 
uh, probably through a simple extension of the New START Treaty, but then potentially also over time through a follow-on agreement that look at other types uh, of, of strategic arms control, uh, including maybe things like you know non-strategic nuclear weapons and things of that nature. That already gets much more tricky. But I think this is a, a priority for a world where uh, you know we don't want to end up in an expensive uh, and dangerous arms race. Absolutely, quite quite a crucial issue, which uh, we'll we'll all monitor how it's going to play out. So each session up until now, during the two days at the Warsaw Security Forum, has had young global leaders, had the young leaders uh, given the opportunity to address uh, the the panels, and this session, of course, is no exception. We have two questions for you, General and Mike. One is coming from Jerome from the Netherlands, and Alexandra from the Ukraine. Let's see what they have to say. Hello, I'm Jerome Byers. I'm from the Netherlands and participating in the AYD program. My question is as follows. The new President Biden is expected to give greater importance to human rights in his foreign policy than his predecessor. While we might expect strong rhetoric on China or Russia, how will the future Biden administration deal with allies such as Turkey or Saudi Arabia? Good afternoon, I'm Alexandra Suprun, I'm from Ukraine, and I'm a participant of the Academy of Young Diplomats. I would like to ask a question to all panelists. Joe Biden seems to have clear opinions on NATO and Russia. Can we expect that his presidency will help Georgia and Ukraine to progress with NATO membership? Thank you. Thank you to both Jerome and Alexandra for their very good uh, questions. Uh, Let me start in reverse order of the questions, General, uh, because uh, the question is whether President-elect Joe Biden or under President-elect Joe Biden, countries like Georgia and Ukraine have a better chance in their pursuit to join NATO. What do you think? Well, I think they have a better chance of unified NATO uh, support for them. But I don't think that there is much sentiment for heading down the road toward NATO given the potential uh, way that that could be seen in Moscow as a provocative action uh, rather than one that is, uh, again, a reassuring and and, uh, uh, that builds the kind of confidence that is necessary uh, over the way forward. I think, again, the commitment uh, may be strengthened and it may be more multilateral and, again, more alliance-based but I think there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of reservations about that. I would think actually that it is more likely that there could be some beginning for the Ukraine for Ukraine in particular to head down the road eventually to some kind of EU uh, accession process uh, more likely than again the NATO accession process. Mike, uh, do you think that the Biden administration will place a greater importance on human rights as a foreign policy element than the outgoing administration has? What what do you think? Absolutely. I think human rights, democracy and rule of law have to be essential to our partnerships. Uh, You know, NATO is not a transactional alliance. It is an alliance that is founded on shared values uh, and governance systems liberal democracy, essentially, and protection of freedoms of the individual. It's spelled out, in fact, in the preamble to the Washington Treaty of 1949, very clearly. And so, uh, look, I, I, I think, you know, with some of these relationships that have been raised, like take Turkey, for example, uh, where there has been uh, democratic backsliding. Turkey is one of the countries with the most uh, journalists who are in prison of any country in the world. Uh, but where we also have a lot of uh, geopolitical Uh, issues on the agenda to include recent statements from President Erdogan suggesting that there is a two-state solution uh, on the island of Cyprus. Of course, Turkey's involvement in the war in Nagorno-Karabakh, its role as a Black Sea power, its involvement in Idlib in northern Syria, uh, its involvement as well in Libya in the conflict there. Uh, These are a lot of issues, not to mention energy and hydrocarbons, both in terms of the Turk stream pipeline from Russia to Turkey, as well as um, uh, uh, hydrocarbon exploration in the Eastern Med. So uh, that's a lot 
to, to put on any one uh, bilateral agenda. And, and it's all going to have to be taken together. Um, you know, there's no separating these issues. But, but look, I, I think human rights, democracy uh, are going to be front and center. Uh, if you look at what's happening in Belarus, look at the statements that, uh, that the president-elect has made with regards to the pro-democracy movement there, standing very firmly uh, with uh, the, the movement, uh, calling for the release of political prisoners, for a new uh, election to be held that is truly free and fair, um, and really condemning the actions of the Lukashenko regime, its torture, its repression, um, and so on and so forth. So that is a principled moral stance. Uh, and I think you will see that uh, with regards not just to Belarus, but to many countries around the world. So thank you to both uh, Jerome and Alexandra for their questions, and of course to the general and Mike for answering them. Um, let, let's zoom in quickly, General. You have already spoken briefly about transatlantic relations. Let's zoom in a bit. This is, after all, the Warsaw Security Forum, and uh, we have a few questions in the forum concerning transatlantic relations. Con for instance, Yuri Brabander from the Academy of Young Diplomats are saying many European leaders were quite jubilant after it became clear that Joe Biden got elected. Uh, do you think that their expectations are bound to be disappointed, considering that so much focus uh, on so much focus uh, will be drawn by China, as you said, China is is the one country that certainly the Biden administration will be spending a lot of uh, time on. Do you think that the jubilations and the uh, on the part of Europeans regarding the incoming president will be disappointed? Well, it depends what your issue and your met metric of uh, measure is. I think um, they're talking in terms of international cooperation and uh, oh, no, US I, I relations. Think, I think there will be a difference. Again, there are certain areas that are going to be continued. Again, as I mentioned earlier, it is a bipartisan view that there needed to be greater firmness in the relationship with, with China. Um, However, in some other ways, this will be a very different uh, approach. And certainly the way that alliances and partners will be valued uh, will be different. That does not mean, though, that there will still not be a concern about those members of the alliance that aren't spending 2% of GDP. And, you know, and well done to Poland, which, by the way, I was privileged to have Polish soldiers under my command in combat in Iraq and in Afghanistan and to work with them previously in Bosnia as a NATO one star as well. And I can tell you that all Poles should be very, very proud of their men and women in uniform and what they have done in those various conflicts. Uh, and Poland obviously has more than met the 2% of GDP as have the Baltic states and those that feel most pressing uh, the threat, the resurgent of threat from Russia, noting that Vladimir Putin has been the greatest gift to NATO since the end of the Cold War, uh, because it really has, again, given it a threat, a challenge around which uh, to converge. But not all NATO nations are spending 2% of GDP. There's some that aren't even spending 1.5% of GDP. And I watched as the Obama-Biden administration, just as the Bush 43 administration had done before when I was in uniform, uh, took European leaders to task. Now, it won't be quite as public. It won't be, uh, it'll be a different style and so forth, but it still is going to be an issue. And that is something that, again, uh, European leaders and NATO leaders in Europe do need to be conscious of. Uh, the American public expects this to happen. Uh, and it's a fact that the U.S. doesn't just spend more than all of our 29 other NATO allies put together, we spend more than twice as much than all of them put together. So I think it is a reasonable, uh, not just aspiration, but a very reasonable re uh, request that, again, those who are on the continent uh, and most uh, appreciative of the threat from the East, once again, uh, would demonstrate that by the spending 2% of GDP. And unfortunately, not spending 2% of GDP based on a lower GDP, a lower denominator that will result from the economic slowdown, but a real expenditure increase uh, on defense and the related items to that. So again, that is still going to be present. And I think folks should be uh, expecting that. But in many other ways, I'm sure that Mike will affirm, uh, again, as a 
as a, someone who has been advising the president-elect during the campaign, uh, that there will be a very different approach, as I mentioned up front, to allies, to partnerships, to international organizations, to multilateral institutions, even to the, frankly, the norms and so forth that have, for all of their shortcomings since the end of World War II, done a reasonably good job at preventing what was featured in the 50 years prior to uh, the end of World War II, which was two world wars and a Great Depression. So Mike, the concern then on the part of some perhaps that there will certainly be a change in tonality uh, and diplomatic efforts, but perhaps not so much in terms of substance are unfounded then. Oh no, I think that's that's yeah. completely off base. Look, there's this yeah. is not a change of tonality. This is a change right. of substance on every major issue that we have on the transatlantic agenda. So let's start with climate change. You know, President-elect Biden has said on day one, the United States is going to rejoin the Paris Climate Accord. He has pledged that he wants to get the U.S. to be net carbon neutral by 2050, which mir mirrors the EU's uh, strategic climate aim. There is a lot that we're going to be doing on climate, I think, straight out of the gate. Um, and also on energy security, by the way, investing in clean energy technologies together on R&D, energy efficiency, um, north-south interconnectors to be able to uh, improve energy security, all those sorts of things. Uh, there's going to be an emphasis on improving the U.S.-EU trade relationship as well, where which has suffered, obviously, from a trade war under the current uh, administration. Uh, you know, President Trump declared that the EU was a uh, geostrategic foe of uh, the United States, worse than China was the quote that he used. Look, we are going to, the, the next administration will view the European Union as a partner of, of first resort, not as a strategic foe. So the, the, the change will be not just one of tonality, but of uh, what we have on our bilateral agenda. But, you know, Clearly, there will be certain issues such as, you know, the Boeing uh, Airbus uh, dispute, such as uh, a carbon border tax adjustment, such as, you know, digital taxation, where we're not going to necessarily see eye to eye. And it's going to take negotiation to arrive at solutions to these issues. But that's normal. You know, all allies uh, don't see eye to eye on 100 percent of what is uh, on their bilateral relationship, uh, and they work to make the relationship better, to strengthen the, the trade and investment relationship, to strengthen the security relationship. I think there, once again, you're going to see a Biden administration come out very strong in terms of investments uh, in defense and deterrence for uh, the NATO alliance. Uh, and as I said earlier, you're going to see this emphasis on promoting democratic norms and institutions and standing by pro-democracy movements uh, in places like uh, Belarus. Uh, standing up for the sovereignty of Ukraine, a country that has been completely neglected uh, under the last four years by the current administration. So you will see a dramatic change on all of these issues that will be much more than just simply, uh, you know, tone. Uh, it will be it will get down to the very core of how we cooperate on these strategic issues. And hopefully uh, it'll be a change where we are able to align our strategic goals so that we're rowing in the same direction. Um, you know, and let me just finish with this. Look at how the current administration approached the Western Balkans. Uh, it sent an envoy to engage in a parallel process um, of negotiations with Serbia and Kosovo that was completely disconnected to what the EU's special envoy was doing in the region. Um, I'm not saying what the Trump administration did was was foolish to focus on economics. I think there's a, a very valid rationale to investing in transportation and economic links. But what we need to be doing is working with the EU. Look, we have a strategic common aim of integrating the Western Balkans into Euro-Atlantic structures. So what you're going to see from a future Biden administration, I think, is a much greater emphasis on working together on those sorts of issues and taking advantage of our synergies and where we have uh, uh, you know, an alignment of interests. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of change, I think, coming. So we, yes, we will see a, a strengthening of multilateralism for sure, hopefully. And uh, of course, this panel was titled and started off with the question, US foreign policy beyond 2020 change or continuity question mark. I think uh, both General Petraeus and Mike Carpenter have both unambiguously answered the question saying there will be change and it will be change for the better. 
Thank you so much to both of you. And of course, the Congresswoman who made a brief appearance. Um, uh, I've been told she had to uh, get an important uh, call afterwards uh, and therefore couldn't uh, rejoin this discussion. But I think she would have very much been in agreement with you on many of the uh, input that you have provided. Thank you so much to the both of you. Uh, this actually, uh, this was the last session of the Warsaw Security Forum. So I hope and believe we finished at a very strong and high note. Uh, and now uh, happy to yield it back to the organizers of the forum. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you Ali. so much, Thanks, Ali. Mike. And it's great to see David. It's great to see Michael here with us at the Warsaw Security Forum. Uh, at the very end, what a fantastic discussion. We really enjoyed it. Uh, there's about 600 people that have been listening on live to this discussion. It's really uh, also reinvigorating to hear you here in Europe uh, and hear about this uh, pre uh, the, the, the previous and also the future foreign policy of the United States. So thank you for this. One thing I wanted to share with you at the very end is actually the results of the poll we have done. 70 voices coming up from our platform. The question was, what will be the top priority for the Biden administration? 40% said reinvigorating the transatlantic alliance. Also 40% countering Chinese influence in Asia and Pacific. And then only 17 said uh, tackling climate change. And today, the Middle East seems to be the least priority, only uh, almost 2%. But that's, of course, very little. So it turns Turns out that the reinvigoration of the transatlantic alliance that you've talked about, but also the big challenge of China is what our experts, our participants, uh, our distinguished guests think is going to be the biggest priority of the future administration. Let's see. We, we will be watching closely starting from January 2021. And in 2021, we also hope to see you live this time at the Warsaw Security Forum so we can meet, talk uh, and see where we are with the state of our transatlantic alliance. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Also, thank you to Congressman Kaptur. I know she had a very important, uh, very important uh, voting uh, and had to leave earlier, uh, but we're very grateful for her, also for her participation. Uh, thank you again.